Welcome to the media ministry of Lake Highlands Church. Our speaker today is the senior pastor, Dr. Jim Reynolds. This morning we continue uh, Stop Luke and Listen. We're in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 15. I'm going to read the scripture, the entire text. This morning, uh, we have the gift of uh, the Holy Spirit working through Kim Weiss, who's a gifted spirit, gifted writer. She has a piece that she's written, a contemporary just reflection on what we call the parable of the sower. So Jesus starts off, and he's announcing no king but God. Everybody who had announced no king but God a few years before Jesus, during his life and after his life, had swords. And when they said no king but God, they were going to bring in the kingdom violently. They started a little movement. It was crushed by the Romans. They were all slaughtered. And everybody went back to the way it was. Except this guy is announcing no king but God. And you don't get a $5,000 rebate on your next car to be a disciple. There's no carrot. There's no, there's nothing. You don't get paid off to become a disciple. There aren't any tanks involved. There aren't any guns involved. There aren't any swords involved. There's no coercion at all involved. And yet he's announcing this this kingdom. So what in the world, Jesus? So Luke chapter 8. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told them this parable. A parable means to be thrown alongside. That's what a parable is. You throw it alongside people. It's a story. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plant. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And then it says, when he said this, and in your text it says, he called out, Really, in the original language, it's, he shouted, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him, what did that parable mean? He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the story, the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, They're not around anymore. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on, they just get choked. Life just chokes them. 
worries, riches, pleasures, and they never grow up. Never. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Okay, picture for a minute, if you will, Dr. Luke. He's sitting down, he's writing a letter to his friend. It's been about 30, 40 years after the cross. And he's been talking to people, people who are touched by the Lord and getting their stories. And this is one of the stories that lands in what will eventually become chapter eight of his letter. It had been a long day. The doctor's stomach rumbled under his tunic. He glanced up once at the elderly lady across the room, wondering if she had heard. She neither moved nor spoke, but sat and waited for him to finish writing what she had told him. He stifled a sigh and dipped his pen into the ink again. This letter to his friend had turned out to be a much bigger task than he had ever imagined. So many stories, so many people touched by the master. And this lady, Joanna, was the treasure hidden in the field. She had seen and heard nearly everything, and she remembered. His right hand began to cramp just as he finished the last sentence he was writing. He laid his pen down and rubbed the offended muscles with his left hand. One more story, I think, Joanna murmured. One more, and we'll say that we're finished for today. As you wish, the doctor reached for his pen. She stopped him saying, only listen, write it down when I finish telling it. When he hesitated, she added, don't worry, the spirit will help you remember. He sat back in his chair, his arms folded across his chest and made himself comfortable, marveling, not for the first time, at Joanna's composure. She might have been carved in marble for all she had moved that afternoon. She sat on a cushioned bench near a window, hands folded in her lap, back erect, her head high, often gazing outside as she spoke, as if she could see the distant past from the open frame. She said, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. The doctor sat still, waiting for her to continue. Is that it? He finally asked. Surely there was more. What else did he say? She turned toward him. The corners of her mouth curled. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. The doctor almost groaned in exasperation. Joanna had done this to him nearly every time they met. She'd tell a parable and then challenge him to tease out its meaning. Well then, was the Lord the farmer? Maybe. But what was different about this parable? After a few moments, he said aloud, seeds. Joanna arched one brow in an expression that let him know he was on the right path. He continued, seeds contain life, though we don't know how it is so. Joanna replied, go on. But not every place that a seed falls will sustain life. Into the following sentence, he said, silence, he said, tell it to me again. And she did. He asked himself, what is it that grows and reproduces to a great harvest or dies away to nothing? Suddenly he knew, the word, her eyes lit up just so. Then the different kinds of ground have to be kinds of people. She smiled. His own disciples did not get so far. They asked the Lord what the parable meant and in private he told them. 
After she had related the meaning of the story, he asked, you said he told them this in private. Why is that, do you think? He was giving them the secrets of the kingdom of God, she answered. I don't pretend to understand all the reasons why he did what he did. In this case, perhaps it was because he needed them to understand that though the message is the same for all, it doesn't have the same effect on all who hear it. He wanted them to know this early on so they wouldn't be discouraged, so they wouldn't be tempted to change the message in order to attract followers. The Lord Jesus said some hard things. She shifted in her seat and glanced out the window again. Some things I still struggle with. I suspect I will go to my grave struggling. She went quiet. And it was then the doctor realized how long the shadows had become. They were losing light, and he wanted to finish and get back before dark. He picked up his pen. Do you know what you're doing? Her question took him aback. I'm writing what you've told me, he answered. You're sowing seed. She stood and paced the length of the room. The doctor noted that she limped a little, favoring her right leg. You think you're writing a letter to a friend. But it's more than that. Your letter is seed. Perhaps only one, perhaps more, perhaps many thousands. There's an old scripture that says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. She stopped. Enough. Enough for today. Go home and prepare your seed. That's a wonderful gift to the church, that reflection. Jesus is telling stories. What's interesting about these stories is they never mention God. They never mention religion or what we call religion. They sort of look at you and they say, do you get it? Do you care? And if you do not get it, and you do not care, then the parable just kind of wanders off and gets thrown alongside somebody else who is interested in it. Jesus' parables are told by a subversive. Jesus is a dangerous guy. He seeks to overthrow kingdoms. That's what a subversive is. You can get put in jail for that. He seeks the overthrow of the governing authorities. So he speaks in mysteries, and he interprets it to his disciples. Something that's really interesting to me about this is none of the soil is plowed. I'm not, I don't know much about farming at all. But none of this soil is waiting. We're not really waiting on God. I mean, our friends are not waiting We're not ready for planting and harvest. So this is about sowing seed in unplowed ground. So the parable is about this gracious wastefulness of God. He throws seed on concrete, we'd say. They didn't have concrete then. It talks about throwing seed on hard ground on thorny ground. He's, the seeds are being thrown everywhere, and it seems like he is wasting seed. The planting is not stingy. It's not calculating. I've been that way. I've looked at people and said, there's a prospect. There's someone that would really get into God. If I could just twist it around where they can see it. This is not this at all. It's not ca- calculating. It's not strategic. It is indiscriminate. It's going after everybody all the time. 
Because, see, we can't figure out why do people re- accept Jesus Christ as Lord and why do they reject him? We don't know. We'll never know. But we know the sower is God in Jesus Christ, and he is throwing whole sacks of seeds onto what looks like very hard, very thorny, and very weedy soil. So we're called to do the same. Do the same. Do it all the time. Pray then and leave the rest to God. You don't need to be frustrated at all. You threw the seed out there. Back in 93 in this church, for two years, I would come over here on Saturdays and have church with the homeless. And there were people that said, you're wasting your time. I never did figure that out. Wasting my time because they're homeless? I don't like the sound of that. But one thing I could say back was, you know what I'm doing? I'm throwing seed. I'm throwing it all over the place. I got more seed flying in the air every, every week than you can believe. It's hitting all over the place. And you know what? It lands. Something happens. I don't know. You know. But I know one thing. I'm to show up with joy and the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm to throw the seeds, pray, and leave the best and the rest to God. Now, remember this. Right now, what I'm saying may just be sitting on top of your head, but you're going to get plowed. You're going to get plowed. See, this seems being thrown out there on hard ground, but you know what life does? It plows your hard ground. It changes the ground under your feet. You know about life. That's what life does. It takes hard ground and breaks it, tosses it, and soft ground appears, softening the soil. I can say that beginning with me, I start off as a protected, self-centered, indulged child. That seems to be kind of what's going on in America, the most affluent nation in the face of the planet. But you know what? And we just kind of look at this, that we're talking about the kingdom, and what's that? But you know, pain, disappointments, a lover betraying you will plow you. Your addictions or the addictions of a loved one will plow you. Your successes even and your failures will plow your life. And you know what happens when that happens? Arrogance leaves. Indifference leaves. I went to school with an Olympic athlete, one of the great quarter milers in the world, won the gold medal, the 1960 Olympics. And he was a proud dude. I had lunch, I had, I had coffee with him several months ago. When I sat down with him and he talked for 30 seconds, his demeanor was changed, transformed. After decades, transformed by one thing, one plow, leukemia. And he couldn't deal with it, plowed him. And Jesus Christ came in to his life. I'm talking to a different guy. He's been plowed. And you look at what, what, what plows do to soil, you don't want to be there. It cuts in there. It hurts you. If you live through it, you get plowed. But at the same time in the world, you're getting plowed. The kingdom good news of God coming in Jesus, life, death, resurrection, and ascension, the love of God that never gives up is also working in you. The mystery of that See that, you know that mustard seed seed story about the kingdom, it's like a mustard seed? The mustard seed is working when we're sleeping. Some people are burned out because they think it begins with them when they get up in the morning. When you get up in the morning, you join God in what he's been doing all night. The Jews always understood that, that 
the morning, the, the day begins when the sun goes down and we go to sleep and God works. I've seen so many, you've seen it. The Holy Spirit is working in kingdom seeds in people. He's doing the invisible stuff. See, we've said that the Word of God was just Scripture. If you burned up all of the Bibles in the world and there was no Bible in the world, the Word of God, the living Word of God would still be alive and well. The Word of God is not ancient. The Word of God fundamentally is eternal. And Scripture is just the written down part of that. Now, believe me, I think Scripture is crucial for the church. But let's understand that there is a living Word of God moving in the world, in us, all the time, but never making us do anything. No compulsion, no bullying of anybody into the kingdom. Simply calling us to decision to turn and believe and put our weight down on it. Hebrews chapter 4 describes this word as alive, active, living in the world. It has a sword. It cuts to the depths of us, penetrating the heart. It goes to the want-to dimension. Unbelief is not intellectual ordinarily. It's about the want-tos. It liberates us and reorders our desiring life. That's, That's what it happens when our hearts are changed. See, when Jesus, something else here, when Jesus is speaking to this very large crowd, he is talking to them about their hearts. This parable is about the people there listening. This parable is about us. This parable of a hard heart, a rocky heart, a thorny heart, or a good heart. This is us in this room. He's interpreting us when he says this. And that's why at the end of the first uninterpreted part, he shouts, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Because there's an urgency about this. There's a life and death urgency. You know, there... I think we should uh, understand that we have, there's no reason for any of us here to believe we're going to live after we die. There's no reason at all. You know, I I kind of assume when I'm up here talking about the good news of the kingdom that you can kind of take it or leave it. And it's sort of like we've we've created an entirely entitled culture that says that if if you turn on to Jesus and give yourself to Jesus, That'll be really great, but you know what? Everything's going to be great if you don't turn on to Jesus and you just blow him off. And the assumption is that you and your little body have got the strength to overcome death. And that somehow you're entitled. I don't think I was even entitled to be here the time I've been here, much less to get to live forever with God. Now, you may think that, but I don't think that. So it could be that when I go, and it won't be that long, you know, it's going to, be ha- it's going to happen. It's just over. It's just over. And if we, don't, if we don't understand that that's the way it is, that you didn't, you didn't get here with entitlement, eternal entitlement written on, that somebody has an obligation to give you that just because you showed up, you know. Actually, what I'm really telling you is, and your kids, you know, your, your children, you, you can tell we're not real terrified anymore. That, that, that being scared is politically incorrect. Being guilty, feeling guilt, that's politically incorrect. God, I don't think that's the real world here. That we're, this is why he raised his voice. I think it's interesting because the NIV says he called out. The other translation said, he shouted, let him who has ears to hear, hear it. You know, because you just hear a little while, hear what the Spirit is saying to us. He's saying you can completely miss Jesus. So let's talk about the soil a minute. There's hard soil. It sits on top of the, the seed sits on top of it. It's taken away by Satan. It's fickle. 
Some people just love big crowds at churches. They love the goosebumps, but the word sits on top of the head. And you say, you know, you were there. Where did you go? It's taken away. It's like going to a huge football game, 100,000 people there. When it's over, they vanish. We kind of live like that sometimes. Some on the rocky ground, they have no root. There's a time of testing. And the testing is, what are you willing to do to advance the purposes of God? And they hadn't worked through that. They weren't willing to suffer, so they fall away. When, when Jesus tells this parable, one of the people listening to it fits this, the apostle Peter. He's about to do the rocky ground thing. He's about to be tested and fall away. And he would not believe that. See, in order to be tested, you've got to suffer. And people who have suffered and gone through that, those people move on to a richer and deeper life. I don't find anybody helping me walk the walk who's not suffered and gone through it to something, to God, to a better place. In fact, all maturity seems to me to be through and on the other side of some suffering. It's just not happening otherwise. You can read Hebrews, you can read the New Testament, and it pretty well confirms that. You've gone through some suffering, through it, and now you're victorious, and you're not whining about God or something. You've moved on, and you're confessing that God is good. You've tasted that he's good because he's redeemed your life. And you found out there's actually something to suffer, to suffer for besides me. I was willing to go through two-a-day uh, practices to play football, go through all kinds of hell to play basketball, all kinds of sports. But you know what? There's actually suffering that's about something a whole lot bigger than that. You're willing to suffer to make money. You're willing to work night and day. But what about something else? What about the purposes of God in your life? And you actually... And, and you find that you're suffering and you can't make any sense out of it. And you have to come back again and say, I know that God is good because of Jesus. Though my circumstances are really bad. Then there's some that are among the thorns. It's those people who are choked. You know what? It doesn't say these people die. They just, they're choked all the time. It's like somebody in a restaurant that never dies, they never eat, they just choke. There's a crisis every other week, every other month. What's it about? Worries. It's about worries. It's about pleasures. It's about riches. We screwed up our money last year. We can't pay our credit cards. We're choked. So we don't grow up. And see, when you don't grow up, God can't really use you because you're just messing your diapers all the time. <laughs> and you, I mean, you can't use you. Really, I mean, I mean, serious. Maturity is huge. It's a huge issue in the church. And I see people who have gone through hell on to the other side who are in maturity, some kind of maturity. We don't arrive in any kind of maturity. But where we're actually asking questions, not about what did I get out of church today, but what did I give to anybody today? When somebody tells me I'm not coming because I just don't get much out of it anymore, I'm saying, God help you. Can I, you know, I, I don't want to, I, I have to really not say much actually. Because I just want to go buy them another bundle of diapers. <laughs> really, this is what we're creating. With, with we're, we're asking, how is this person doing? How's, I'm asking, are you growing up? Biggest thing going on with my grandkids right now and my kids. So are you growing up? Am I growing up? Nothing sadder than a guy my age who's not growing up. God, we, we just we really look mad. It's hard to hide how ugly it is when you're this age and you start acting like a kid. I want a kid to act like a kid, not me. So he wants us to grow up and, and actually begin living life so we're not choking all the time. And then there's seed on the good soil. Those with a noble heart who retain the word and persevere to the crop. 
These people act on their faith, and there's a perseverance. That word perseverance is in the text. We don't have it up there, but you read it. They persevere. You know, perseverance is never needed when life's easy. This thing about the the good soil is about people who persevere. I'm in a period of perseverance right now. I just tell you, somebody asked me, I think John Whitehead and I were talking. I'm in a period where it's not easy. It's not easy. I don't, I don't get up and say, man, this is just the greatest thing in the world, what I'm doing. I'm, I love it, and get up, and this week's going to be wonderful. I don't, I'm not doing that right now. I'm going through a season of, whew, man, here we go. It's hard. What am I called to do? Quit? No, no not quit. We're not called to quit. Just think about your life. Perseverance, when he says these people persevere, that implied it got real hard and they're going through it. And the only way they're going through it is through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's get that real clear with that. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the only way they got a noble heart is because the Holy Spirit came and changed them from a rock hard heart to a soft heart, to a flesh heart. That's how it all happened. But there's a lot of perseverance going on. And I find sometimes I hear stories about people quitting in this church or people who go here, go there, just do all kinds of stuff. And I think, you know, I just like to do the same thing. Dang it. One of my grandsons says, I don't want to be at church. I say, well, I don't either. I, get, I have to persevere, but you don't? Come on. When does the day come when you start growing up, when all of us start growing up? Everybody. Because this is about, this thing about the noble heart, that doesn't come except through the power of the Holy Spirit. This whole thing is about the Holy Spirit coming and changing our hearts, and it's about us persevering. And then you, do you realize what it says? That the fruitfulness is a hundredfold. It's explosive fruitfulness. Yeah. I was reading, uh, I, I, there was a guy, I can't even remember this guy's name, uh, an actor. Hugh, who is it, the guy that acted with, uh, I'll talk to y'all, uh, Sandra Bullock in one of those movies. He's an, he's an English actor. Three weddings and a funeral guy. Grant, Hugh Grant, all right. Hugh Grant, I was reading about Hugh Grant yesterday, you know, he's... Everybody thinks he's, many people, millions of people think. He said he doesn't even believe in marriage because he just can't imagine 40 years of living with the same person. And I'm thinking, Hugh, what's it going to look like when you go to your kid's birthday party? You can't hardly remember her mother's name. And you're 75 years old and you're going to grandkids. You can't remember who the mother is or the grandmother. There's an explosive fruitfulness that comes from persevering in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think he's, you know, I don't expect, I'm not beating him up. I I think he's really a good actor, but actually he has no idea of who Jesus Christ is anymore. He has no idea that on the other side of suffering would would be a life more richer than you could ever believe. And that at the end of your life, you can look around and say, you know what, there was suffering, but there was covenant in the middle of this. The Holy Spirit was always in this, bigger than anything I was going through. And there's a remarkable fruitfulness. And I even look around and see it. There's a remarkable fruitfulness in my life, just, you know, in my life and in your life, because you're still in the game walking it out, faithfully walking it out, in the power of the Holy Spirit, hanging with people and not quitting people. The easiest thing to do is to pull away from the people. And so this is, this is what's going on. And you know what this is? This is about God radicalizing us. This is radical. We talk about the Muslim terrorists becoming radical. They read stuff on the internet and they get radicalized to violence. What I'm talking about is reading scripture in the power of the Holy Spirit and getting radicalized to love. Radical. 
to faith, to hope. Get radical about it. This is a radical faith that we're into here. A story, a great story, you've heard it before. In the 20th century, Mother Teresa was known, she was probably the top five known people in the world at one time. She was led as a young woman to leave her teaching job in India and go to the streets of Calcutta, and she built what was called a leprosarium. A bigger room than this, way bigger room than this, where people who were dying of leprosy, limbs were falling off, were in the beds. And there were hundreds of people in there ministering to them. And the ministry of Jesus Christ in the room with the lepers in Calcutta was to help those folks die like angels. They had lived like, you know, horrible conditions. Die like angels. And a very cynical, unbelieving man who had gotten interested in Teresa and was covering her as a journalist, an English guy named Malcolm Mugridge, went to the leprosarium, and I've forgotten which town it was in, I think Calcutta. He he rejected Jesus. The word had been sitting on Malcolm Mugridge's head for a long time. He had rejected it. He went through the leprosarium and walked, and the stench of the dying bodies overwhelmed him. And he was depressed by the death because several people were dying in the room at any particular moment. It was a huge thing, much larger than this room. All kinds of people, though, ministering hope and Jesus and prayer and love, and they've been doing it forever. And he's in there with these people, and he's talking to these, these women who are ministering in there and the power of God and the joy of their lives. And he watches some people help other people hold their hands as they die. And, and they're doing it in the name of Jesus Christ in very quiet ways, just praying and loving on these people. And he begins to realize no human power can do this. There is nobody on the planet who can sustain this. You cannot get up every day and come down here to this. There has got to be a God of love in the world. He was being plowed. He was being opened up to the living hope of believers in the middle of death. We live our lives in the middle of death, but we have overcome because the living word of God is imperishable. It is extravagant and it is ridiculous, all of it. It makes no sense except it's true. It's what Paul said, it's foolish that God could love like this. And that he could have won the, back, the, the victory over Satan. The book of Acts follows up, and I'll just say a word about it. The book of Acts goes on 28 chapters about the word of the kingdom. But I've read it like it's a story about Peter. It's not. He's there early and he fades away. It's not a story about the Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's in the first chapter and you don't see her again in the book. It's not about a mega church in Jerusalem. It's not even about Paul. He's under house arrest at the end, but he's announcing the word of Jesus to the Roman world, but you don't know what happened to him because he's not the point. It's not about us. It's about the mighty word of God that's being enacted by the Spirit in person after person after person. They hear it, the seed finally comes into their plowed hearts, they turn to God and the story of love gets, is, takes off. His presence, his power, his authority, and they bear fruit. The explosive fruitfulness of God happens when God's love takes us over. If you read the, the, the gospel, it's about this. At, there's, there's six scriptures here that do this. They're just the signpost of the whole book. Chapter 2, verse 42, they continued in the apostles' gospel. Chapter 5, verse 42, they never stopped announcing the good news of the word, though they're being persecuted. Chapter 6, verse 7, the word of God spread. 
Chapter 12, verse 24, the word spread. People are living and dying. Personalities come and go, but the word of the Lord abides forever. Chapter 19, verse 20, the word spread. All over the Roman Empire it spread. And at the very end in chapter 28, 31, he's announcing the word of God, the good news of the kingdom of God under house arrest. It's about God's purposes in the world. That's what it's about with us. When I was 18 years old and I went to Abilene Christians 700 miles away from home, there was a coach that coached me in my freshman year. I mentioned this before. He and his wife, uh, I knew well. They loved me. They were my parents away from home. Three years ago, he died and I preached his funeral. Three days ago, I got news that his unbelieving son, who lives in Dallas, has Lou Gehrig's disease. I sent Jimmy a little note. I reminded him of our invisible bonds that go back to 1960. But what I thought about was this. All the way back to 60 and now, the grass withers. The flowers droop, but the Word of God abides forever. We are dying, and the issue is whether or not we're connecting with the Word of God, and it is coming and being fruitful. Jimmy's mother that mothered me 50 years ago is now calling a bunch of us who knew Coach to cast the seeds of the kingdom at the end of his life. So my little message was that, but it had to be like a parable because Jimmy is really turned off to God and church and preachers. But I'm his friend. I loved his daddy. His daddy loved me. I love his mother and his mother loves me. Right now, we are the witnesses who are casting the seeds into a man who's being plowed. We're called to simply be faithful. You're doing it. You're called to do it all the time. That is what we do. Do it. Just announce it. It's not an argument. It's an announcement. Just be attentive to the good news. It's not be good. That's not it. You missed it. You swung at it and you missed it. It's God has won in Jesus Christ. Speak it to every life circumstance and keep on speaking it month, year, decade because they're being plowed out there. And a child of yours who rejected it five years ago or 10 years ago is getting plowed and the kingdom's still working. Let us pray for the advancement of the kingdom of God in this church, in us, in this neighborhood, and in the world. This is what's going on. Not the personalities, but God. So Lord God, may your Holy Spirit come and let us have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us right now. We love you, God. We thank you. We bless you that we are, we are given the chance, we're given the opportunity to throw the seeds, to cast the seeds into people's lives, living and dying. We declare to you, Lord, that the grass withers, that the flowers droop, but that the word of the gospel of the kingdom of God never dies, ever, lives on and on and on. We praise you, Lord. We thank you. I pray, Lord, that you come into us this morning and, yes. and give, us new, give us new life, Lord. Come into us. You may have been plowing somebody who walked in the door today. Just come, Lord, and be with us and take your root in us. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you. Come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Praise to God. Praise to God. Come on, y'all, stand up. You know, Carol's life is being plowed right now. You don't know her circumstances. Some of you do. Some of you don't. If you did, what she just said. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about that. So let us, you know, whatever you're doing, if you got ears here. Because I tell you what, this is, a, this is a miracle right here. You know, what we want in the church are miracles. You know, we don't want manipulation of the kingdom. We want miracles of the kingdom. That's it. We got to have it. It ain't going to happen otherwise. Hmm? Yeah. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turn. Have those that would would pray with you. I know we have people that that want and need to be prayed for. Would you, if you want to pray for somebody, would you come down, uh, please, to the front so they can see you're here? And I don't, you know, it doesn't really matter how many times you've prayed, been prayed for recently. If you need prayer, you come. Can't overdo this. We don't know what we don't know what the kingdom of God's doing in our hearts. We're just told to be faithful. Proclamation, prayer, praise. Anybody in the room that you need to touch? I mean, there's somebody in the room that I, I said, you know, you can encourage before you leave or you may need encouragement. Whatever it is, if you need a prayer, come. I'll lead us in a prayer. A long time ago, we, we uh, understood this together, that this does not end worship. We've just been sharing our worships. That we go out now to present our bodies to God as living sacrifices. The Holy Spirit's alive in us. We go out to just throw the seeds of the kingdom everywhere. And I mean share the kingdom of God with people that you in the natural would not like, do not like. Just share it. Let, ask God to do miracles in your business, miracles in your relationships, miracles in your marriage, in your neighborhood. God, we just ask for this to happen. May it happen in us. May we be just loving, loving, 
likenesses of Jesus in the power of the Spirit. We come to you, God, because you're our Father, because Jesus Christ is our Savior and brother, and because the Holy Spirit has come alongside of us and helped us and give us power to live. Thank you, Lord. We pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And the body says, Amen. Amen. Bless you.